Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and we're back with Tom Frank. Thanks for joining us again. So, Tom is the author of What's the Matter with Kansas? Listen, Liberal. And if you want a longer bi biography, go watch the rest of the segments, and you really should anyway, because it will help get this one. Um, so we're picking up where we left off, which is you're in college. You're still a Republican. Um, well, I gradually uh, transitioned, I would say, as I was in college, away from being a Republican. And uh, I mentioned some of the things that, 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 that opened my eyes, but by the time I left college, I was no longer a Republican. But were you still, as you said in the earlier segment, enthusiastic patriot? Are you still, would you still say the patriotic? Pledge, pledge with the enthusiasm? We weren't were saying words? that by then anymore in college. Um, how would I put this? I've always been patriotic. Uh, I don't think that my uh, views about uh, the economy or, the, or socialism or whatever you want to say, you know, you mentioned Bernie Sanders. I don't think that conflicts with uh, patriotism. I guess it depends how you define patriotism. Yeah. No, I'm, I still, I, I'm, I'm a very patriotic person. But then there's a big division over the patriotism of your early days, which are well, yeah, I'm not. A, I've never been. A, I've never been a, a, a you know a hawkish or a militaristic. You know, like I, I, war is a dreadful, terrible, awful thing. It's not something to be entered into lightly. You know that that is uh, and and the the kind of uh, well, like, the way the way people use uh, patriotism. But, but being to, a socialist, in the, certainly during Cold War days, yeah, was well, unpatriotic. Well, a, 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 a patriot in the sense that I love my country. I mean, that's like. You know, you, I, I feel, you know, very profoundly about that. That's, you know, obviously, if I, if I didn't love my country, I wouldn't be doing all the stuff I'm doing. That's, <laughs> that's, but, but, that's the first and foremost. But there's loving the country from the point of view of loving the people of the country. And then there's loving... And the history and, and everything else about it. And, and then, uh, but, but, but patriotism is often, I think what you're getting at is the way it's used to uh, well, support the sort of uh, military Militarism industrial. and, yeah, and that's, patriotism. That's, that's as, awful. That's a you know, horrible perversion of patriotism. And during, during the Cold War, you know, God gets added to the pledge. The idea of even having a loyalty oath is a, mostly a Cold War phenomena. Yeah. So the idea you must support your government right or wrong, you must support this Cold War, you have yeah. to hate the commies and the socialists. Yeah. I mean, that's one type of patriotism. Yeah. There's, there's another, which to my mind is mostly about love for the people of the country, not yeah, the... Yeah, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. That, but that would, you know, the, the, the sort of militaristic, that's always been, in my mind, that's always been, you know, an obvious, uh, what would you call it? What would you call it? And, uh, you know, it's a scam. It's, it's a fraud, always. I've, that's apparent, you know. Okay, so, so you're, you're, you're kind of evolving out of Republican Party, right or wrong, as you leave college, uh, but, but some, I somewhere a very conscientious person. So I should mention to you here, and this is something I've noticed as I've grown older, that there are a number of of uh, people on the left wing who started out as conservatives and who believed in the promise of America, the sort of Norman Rockwell superficial, you know, uh, Frank Capra promise of this country, and then realized when they became adults that it just wasn't true and that there was a lot that had to be done. And the person I would specifically refer to you here is uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, who had a very similar background to mine, grew up in Oklahoma, and was very conservative, and learned at some point that, you know, that, that this system that we have simply doesn't deliver what it says it delivers. You know, it doesn't even come close. And in fact, there is all sorts of, of uh, uh, fraud and monopoly and misbehavior that goes on uh, and, uh, you know, we all hate elites, and yet elites are firmly in the saddle, and we've, elites are more powerful today than they have ever been in our lifetimes. And, uh, you so know, when does that become acceptable when thinking it, When did my eyes, uh, the, while I was in college, I started figuring, I started understanding that. Because, you know, the, 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 where you would have come from, they would have accused you of wanting to promote class war, which is what yeah. the term <laughs> yeah, they yeah. use when you start to talk like That's this. That's an interesting so. thing like the, about that term, which is, Class conflict is something you're going to have whether you want to have it or don't want to have it. It's, it is a sociological, you know, this is, the, this is in the structure of society. There's nothing you can do about it, that there, is, there are going to be classes. It is uh, to some degree natural. Um, to some degree, it's a, you know, class war is a, a cl class animosity is, uh, is a sad thing, uh, of course, but it's also, it's there all the time. And it's the way I look at it. It's kind of like this. Uh, it's this sentiment that's out there, 
in society, in the, in, in, in the public, and the trick is to appeal to it without saying you're appealing to it. And so that's what I've, this is the, the sort of, this is the theme of what's the matter with Kansas, that Republicans have, and by the way, Trump has perfected this. Republicans figured out, beginning in the 1970s, how to appeal to class animosity and flip it on its head and where they would no longer be on the receiving end of it. Now, you got to remember going back to the 30s, back to the, the Great Depression, uh, and even before that, Republicans are always on the receiving end of class animosity. They're the rich, you know, the money bags, the fat cats, you know, the Wall Street guys, who the Democrats, you got your plain spoken guys like Harry Truman, who didn't even go to college, who are always making fun of them. You know, the horny handed sons of toil are laughing at the, uh, at the, at the rich guys. And this has, uh, this for, 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 for people one generation above me or two generations above me, that's always the way American politics unfolded. Well, in the 1970s, Republicans figured out a way to flip that entire thing on its head with this idea of the liberal elite talking about the media, you know, uh, and uh, talking about uh, 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 college professors, all the things that they- And, part, and because it's true. Uh, it, it works because yeah, it's true. <laughs> in part because it's there true. Is a liberal but it's also, it's also a massive exaggeration. I mean, but, uh, but, but it, yes, it is true. As I, as I have pointed out in Listen Liberal, there is a, it's not just a grain of truth to this. This has become more true as we've gone along. Like, I don't think it was right to uh, go after McGovern that way. I don't think that was objectively correct to go after McGovern that way. But it, it's, uh, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton outraised Donald Trump two to one. You know, something has changed in those intervening 40 years. All right, so when does the coin really drop for you? Because if, you, if, if the high school you heard this you, what would that high school student think? Oh, I would have been, I think I would have been open to it. I was very interested in ideas. It's just that, that what ideas are you exposed to? And, and in, in, the, in, the, you know, in the early 1980s, we weren't exposed to all that much. And, you know, public school, public high school in, in Kansas City, you, you wouldn't have come across ideas like this. Um, you know, I knew I had uh, uh, friends who, who had some exposure to stuff like this, but that's because they came from like union families and stuff like that, which I didn't understand until years later. Um, but this but, would have been considered horrible talk from a real Reagan supporter. Well, yeah, I suppose so. By the way, Reagan himself uh, had a transition in his own life. In the other direction. Where he, yes, exactly. Where he went from being, you know, uh, I went from being Reagan to being, you know, to talking like Bernie Sanders. He went the other way, you know. He got offered a good deal. He joined, joined, <laughs> yeah, joined yeah. the Cold War and he McCarthyism. Really, and he, was, and he was really good at it. I went to his uh, presidential library a little while ago, and I had forgotten how, um, how smooth he was, how... Uh, perfectly he internalized the sort of talking points of corporate America and how the, he stitched together this very ideology that I'm describing, this kind of upside down populism, and really believed in it and really sold it. Really, really, really sold this thing. All right, so here's the question which you didn't want me to ask and you'll answer it however you please. You start to move more and more away from this Republican version of Americanism. Uh, you start to, at some point, entertain the idea that socialism isn't the great enemy of mankind. Um, wh 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 what's your father thinking about? What does he think, you, what does he think of my, what does he of think where, of my where, views? Of where you're heading. <laughs> now, oh, I don't know. Uh, he's not a political person. You gotta remember, Paul, um, I think the vast majority of Americans are, do not follow politics with the same kind of hawk-eyed, you know, scrutiny that you and I do, you don't, know? Most people, I assume, don't follow it yeah, at all. Yeah, exactly. Except maybe the height of an election. And they, they go about their business and they do their job and they, you know, and they live their lives. And, um, uh, you know, look, I get called a lot, of, a lot of names when I'm back home in Kansas and I get called a lot of names online and, you know, that, that happens. And sometimes I'm, the New York Times makes you up to be someone else. <laughs> Yeah, really these fast. things happen. I mean, so, you roll with it. It's a, I, I'm, you know, I, uh, uh, I think my ideas are sound, and and I think I'm a good writer, and uh, you know, and I like what I've done with, you know, I'm I'm proud of what I've done with my with my life and my my talents such as they are. Um, and so, uh, your father not being uber political, it doesn't become a, no, a, a political not. argument or debate. I mean, you have your views, he has his, and life goes on. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Uh, 
Is, is there, people, people live to, you know, Republicans and Democrats, this whole idea that we've self-segregated and that we can't stand each other, I, I can't help but think, I mean, maybe that is, that I is true. I think maybe it's more now because it used to be there wasn't such differences. Well, there's yeah, it's lots, not lots of people it's too, far lots more of different polarized. views in families and stuff like that. It happens all the but time. Especially with Trumpism. It's, it's, <laughs> oh, man. It's yeah. far more polarized. Yeah, know. yeah. And anyway, again, is there kind of a turning point for you, uh, a thing? And like you, you, you got Reagan launching the, he's full of Cold War rhetoric and he's got, uh, you know, the, the foreign policy is a real focus. Is there a single It's the dom thing. domestic uh, Reaganism introduced, really introduces neoliberalism. Well, I described, uh, I described like my exposure to the world of work, uh, my exposure to ideas, my exposure to history. Uh, and these things were all, all really served to um, open my ideas to the world around me. When do you come to the conclusion the system itself, and I, I believe you've come to this conclusion, breeds inequality? Because that's become one of the main themes you can write I, can about. Can I tell you something? That yeah. you, you might not know this. So in 1997, my uh, colleagues and I at the Baffler magazine put out an anthology of our, the, the essays that we were proudest of. And the subtitle of that, the, the book was called uh, Commodify Your Descent. And the subtitle of it was, it, it has the phrase, uh, uh, something in the in the new gilded age and we were the this was in 1997 we were some of the first i think we I, i've looked it up other people used that phrase before we did but we were the first ones to put it in a book title uh in the new gilded age it was uh, essays for this new gilded age that we were living through and i've always been historically minded so for me when they deregulated the banks when reagan uh, you know clearly was uh uh, you know, Reagan started the great bank deregulation project. Uh, Clinton really uh, advanced the ball on that one. But uh, when it began under Reagan and the great stock market boom began in the 1980s and really has never, well, I mean, then you had the, I mean, anyhow, it began in the 1980s. You could, and, and the destruction of organized labor at the same time, of course, PATCO and all the things that, that came in the wake of that and the free trade agreements, it was very obvious to me and I think it should have been obvious to everyone that we were setting out uh, uh, on a, a straight shot towards the sort of pre-Depression America, you know, uh, 1920s style America, Gilded Age style Pre -New America. Pre-New Deal. Yes, that that was, that was clearly where we were headed. Now, uh, you know, those ideas were in the air at the time, but it wasn't, we talked about this uh, in an earlier segment, that it wasn't until Bill Clinton came along that the Democratic Party itself basically said goodbye to the New Deal, that th this was now an unattainable thing and we shouldn't even be trying to, you know, social equality was something that we shouldn't even be aiming for in this country anymore. We needed to say goodbye to that. And so by 1997, that was obvious to me that we were on our way to, we were in a new Gilded Age. And it was also, uh, the, you might remember the media climate of the 1990s, talking about a new economy, that there were completely new economic rules guiding how, how, you know, how, how uh, buying and selling and how the acts of exchange... And it would how, relieve poverty around the world. Yes, and, there, and, and, and that there would end never on, again be a downturn and we were in the long boom. Yeah. Dow 36,000, you do remember this crap? Yeah. And so part of my... Uh, uh, job as a scoffer, as the H. L. Mencken of my time, was to constantly be puncturing this idiocy, and so I took a, I took to that task with uh, with relish. But but part of that was was seeing the historical press. This was so obviously a replay of the mania and the enthusiasm from the 1920s. You know, where they said exactly the same thing, that everybody is going to be rich because of mutual funds. You know? They were repeating this like word for word almost in the 1990s. For someone who studied history, this was, you know, this was, this was, this was obvious what was, what was going on. Yeah, the, they have the, the line from Wall Street, greed is good, yeah. but the Clinton version of that. The Clinton version was much should, more. Should be bubbles are good. Yeah, yeah, but the, the new economy period in the late 90s, that was, uh, that was something much that, that was, much more disturbing than the greed is good 1980s because in, in, in the 1990s it was like that this is a boom that will that will make everyone rich this is a boom that will never end uh, this is a boom that will bring about uh, that will raise up the the feeblest and the weakest among us this is a democratic boom I mean it was such fatuity you know such incredible folly 
All right, we only got a few minutes left. I know you got to go, and I'm hoping we're going to pick this Everybody up. Everybody loves to hear it. The 1990s, man. I could talk about the 1990s forever. Well, <laughs> let's, can you stay? No, no, no. I got, I got to right. go home. I got to go home. All right. Well, 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 we will. I hope we have a chance days. to we'll do come the back 1990s. And do that, yeah. Yeah. But, but let me just end up by getting us back to the moment we're in. And how dangerous do you think the moment we are in is? And what do you think people should do about it? I thought it was uh, on election night and the few weeks after that, I was very afraid. You know, I have a family. Uh, I, you know, I, I am obviously deeply concerned for the future of this country. I love this country. Uh, I was very worried about Donald Trump becoming president. See, you know what's made me feel relieved? Is to learn how incompetent he really is. This guy, he's got a Republican Congress. He still can't get anything done. That's a huge, enormous relief for me. For now. For now, right. Now, there's still, as, like, as he I can screw earlier, foreign policy so easily, uh, also, you know, because the president has so much. Pence is in the wings, so. Yeah, and, and uh, look, like I said, the next Trump is going to be much worse than this Trump. The, uh, the next one, what Trump proved, again, is how to beat the Democratic Party. Until the day the Democratic Party takes a long, cold look in the mirror and understands where they have gone wrong, and by the way, and I'm ready. The minute they want to uh, have me come and, and talk to them about it, I'm ready to do it. But you as know. you said, they got a vested interest. Yeah, they're not in, interested in that. <laughs> they got a vested interest in not seeing it. In never it. seeing that, exactly. And never taking that, that, uh, that long look in the mirror. But the, the day they do, um, they will start to understand what they have done. And they will also start to understand how to defeat these guys. I mean, this is a long, remember now, if you take one thing away from this, this is a long process. This is not Trump. This goes back to Nixon. This goes back to Reagan. This goes back to Wallace. And it goes back to financialization of yes. the whole economy. Yes, it does. But the, I mean, the, the strategy that Trump used, the fake populism that Trump used, okay, this is deep in the, you know, this is a strategy invented years ago. And what the, and the, the and by the way, the string that the Democrats are playing out also goes back to that same period in the late 60s and early 70s when they decided they weren't going to be a party of working class people anymore and they weren't going to be interested in the uh, New Deal anymore. They were, going to be this, they, were going to, they were going to be a very different party, a party of the uh, information economy, you know, the post-industrial economy. And they made an they incredible blunder at that time and they've never looked back. They've never questioned that blunder. And until the day they do, and when I say how dangerous a moment, it's only partially about Trump. When you add climate change into the, into yes. the equation. And our inability to act. There's kind of no time for the normal long-term and, and, process. And, and, and if, you really want to, if you really want to end on a depressing note, Paul, just a short time ago, I, for one, felt like we had the answers within our grasp. Barack Obama, 2008, here he comes. These enormous crowds. He's so smart. I had met him. I lived in Hyde Park, his neighborhood in Chicago. He was my state senator. I admired that man. Uh, I wanted him to be great. I thought he was going to be great. I, saw, I looked at him and I thought I saw Franklin Roosevelt. And I thought, this is the Franklin Roosevelt for our time. Here comes the right man at the right moment with the right ideas. And it didn't happen. And he had the power and he had the people behind him. He had the world behind him and it didn't happen. And that is, I think that is in a way far more depressing than Donald Trump. You know, that we had the man and we had the energy and we had the ideas and it, I don't want to say we blew it because I don't feel like we did, but yeah, our side blew it. Uh, maybe the thing that hopefully won't be so depressing and 2020 I think is going to be the most decisive election in the history of the country. Um, if the broad majority of people who had that feeling about Obama learn the lesson and learn, you know, <laughs> listen liberal, yeah. learn, the, yeah. learn the lesson because maybe then that can be a turning but point. But we're all, if of people course, drink we're all, the Kool-Aid again we're about I know, some but we're, all, we're all prisoners of I mean, now we're in the aftermath of that sort of golden moment of 2008, 2009, and we're prisoners of our hope that we had for Barack Obama, and we don't want to let that go. And other, and other people have watched their way of life slip away. Everything has gotten worse. Inequality is, is out of control. Uh, other people have gone for Trump. Trump is like this sort of, you know, Obama through the looking glass, you know. Uh, 
you know, promising a sort of curdled hope, a uh, kind of resentment and outrage, you know, but appealing to a lot of the same people, a lot of the same emotions. It's, we're in the backwash of hope now, and it's going to take, it's going to take some, something extra, an extraordinary effort to, to pull that off again. And I don't know if the world will go along with that. I mean, you, have, you can have heroic individuals here and there, a Bernie Sanders, but Barack Obama, a heroic, you had the heroic individual, but you also had history cooperating, you know, the financial crisis, <clears throat> you know, that gave him that, that, that moment of possibility. And that's not going to happen again. Uh, or it might happen again and instead uh, put the power in the hands of a completely different kind of individual, um, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, 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 should, I, should, I should never end on a note like this, but I think to be realistic about where we are, you, you have to look this thing in the face. You got to. And, and then, that's, and, that and is what it, happened to because us. Because can't, we can't keep living our lives as if it's all normal. You can't keep doing business as if it's all normal. Yes. We ain't in a normal moment of history. It's, yes. it's happened. There and, and have been that, moments that, like this before, but never so existential. But there's, a, there's another problem is that we, we can't be critical. Uh, Democrats love to imagine that they're the party of intellect. Uh, and the party of discernment and of learning, and that they can see through, they can pierce the veil, and they can see through the, uh, the phoniness. But we have tremendous problems turning our scrutiny on <clears throat> the Obama period and on what happened. And that's what I tried to do in Listen Liberal. And I, I invite your viewers to, uh, to read it. It's a first step in a process that has to happen. Well, I hope you'll be back. We'll do the 90s. We'll do the Obama years. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. And, <laughs> and don't uh, forget George W. Bush and the wrecking crew. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining us. You got it, man. Anytime. Yeah, great. To be continued. Thanks very much for joining us on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. Please join us and uh, we'll be doing more of this. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.